right, good morning everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician <coughs> at Gates Brain Health. And we do functional neurology and functional neurology involves management of concussion patients from a natural perspective where lots of times we're doing brain rehab activities as well as assessing levels of inflammation in the body and factors which may not be allowing the brain to heal after a head injury. So <clears throat> we're doing our series on concussions. We've talked about a variety of uh, factors from fatigue to uh, effects of spec scans and leaky gut syndrome and, and things like that. Now we're talking about blood tests and really a lot of what prompts this discussion is that so many people have a head injury, they go to the emergency room, they may get a CT scan and they're told that they're normal. And some of them, well, a large percentage, well, let's say it this way, a certain percentage will recover and have no symptoms. Uh, the percentages between those who will have chronic symptoms varies depending on what you read. Some will say uh, maybe 15% of kids are going to have post-concussion syndrome with adults, maybe it's around 6 to 9%. However, other studies have come out and said that upwards of 50% of people after a mild traumatic brain injury at about a year later are still going to have residual cognitive symptoms. So again, it depends on the research article that you read. But nonetheless, uh, so many people have concussions and they look normal and they appear normal and their testing is normal, which has prompted me to go into the literature and, and give you some of the more up-to-date findings so that you know that there are ways to validate what's going on. So validation of head injuries is definitely something that I enjoy if, you know, if it is there, if the, uh, if the data is there, so to speak. So within the realm of traumatic brain injuries, there are severe traumatic brain injuries, there are mild traumatic brain injuries. Uh, if somebody has a skull fracture and they have, you know, a subdural hematoma and they have hemorrhages within their frontal lobes, that's a different story typically than someone who has a concussion, but they don't have a skull fracture. They don't have any hemorrhages within their brain. Now, for those who have really severe head injuries, uh, this, I found this article for you. So if you know someone with a severe brain injury, you can talk to the doctors about this. The CRP to albumin ratio which is being used for sepsis and even different types of cancer and predicting the outcome. They're finding that this ratio is also a positive predictor of those who are going to have a favorable outcome after a really severe head injury versus, um, versus those who have a lower serum uh, CRP to albumin ratio. So I think that's somewhat interesting. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale. And this is certainly used also in terms of rating the severity of a brain injury. So if you hear someone talk about a GCS score, this is where they're looking at, you know, can the person open their eyes after the head injury, you know, even just talking to them or pinching down on a thumbnail to elicit pain. Can they elicit a verbal response? Do they have any motor responses? And so it's a grading system. This is from the CDC's website. <clears throat> so. You can see the link at the top if you want to go look at it. But nonetheless, the GCS has been used for years to say, okay, well, this person has a lower GCS. They're less likely to fully recover. Now, that is true to an extent, but it's not as true as uh, doctors have hoped in terms of predicting exactly. So they're finding that the CRP to albumin ratio along with the GCS helps doctors to predict who's going to recover well versus maybe those that are not. Uh, so yeah, this is just a highlight. This is the first study to explore the positive or the predictive value of uh, C-reactive protein to albumin ratio in patients with TBI. Our results showed that um, the CAR, which is what I just referenced above, was significantly higher in non-survivors than survivors. And this article is Clinical Neurology and Neurosurgery 2020. So this is a brand new article. Okay, so. Another area of interest with blood markers, particularly for the insurance industry, is for them to figure out biomarkers that say, okay, if this person has a positive blood test, then we need to progress to an MRI. 
So let me back up. So let's say a person has a head injury and they have this head injury and they have a CT scan, which is negative. There's the potential or possibility that you can have a negative CT scan, but still need an MRI and the MRI will show something. But in the world of third party payers, they're trying to figure out when to order tests and when not to order tests, particularly because it reflects um, payments. Um, and again, that's just the reality of not knocking it, but you know, from their side, they're not going to want to pay for imaging on everything. So they come up with models to try and stratify <clears throat> who needs what. So basically, uh, this is from Medicina and, and they were looking at CT negative, uh, basically here, patients with CT negative, but have positive MRI findings. So they then looked at these different uh, values of different blood biomarkers. S100B, I oftentimes call it S100-beta, but S100B is one of the ones that's been studied the most. GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP is easier to say, uh, and then tau protein. Gosh, I need to do a talk on chronic traumatic encephalopathy and where we're at with that, but uh, they looked at tau protein, and in essence, they saw that acute GFAP distinguish CT negative and MRI positive from those who are CT negative and MRI negative, meaning GFAP was pretty good. So by measuring GFAP, you can predict, and again, GFAP is basically an astrocytic uh, protein marker from the brain. Uh, so GFAP, when it's high, can basically stratify those who are going to have a negative CT but a positive MRI. And then they also said that uh, it helped with diffuse axonal injury, uh, and those who had a negative CT scan as well. And then also tau shows promise in detecting diffuse axonal injury also. So that's kind of cool. Uh, this is a really neat article looking at S100B. And one of the main criticisms of measuring S100B is that it does go up with physical exertion. And so, or it can go up with orthopedic injuries. So let's say somebody falls off a roof and you fracture your arm and your leg. Well, your S100B levels are going to go up. But if you also hit your head in that circumstance, your S100B levels can also go up. So in this study, they looked at high school athletes. I love the journal Frontiers in Neurology. They do some cool stuff. They looked at high school football players, and they controlled for physical exertion by looking at uh, biomarkers for muscle tissue breakdown. And they controlled for that, and in essence, they found... Um, let me go down here. Basically, there's a significant positive association between impact kinematics and increase in S100B levels. The influence of strenuous exercise and muscle damage on serum 100B levels was negligible. So they controlled for it, and this was really the first study. You can see up here, to our knowledge, this is the perspective cohort study. is the first clinical study examining the association between what I just talked about. S100B, subconcussive head, head impacts, and adjusting for physical exertion. And I just highlighted some things up here. I, I highlighted here more than I typically do. But again, there's 2.5 million high school and college athletes engaged in contact sports. So that's important to know. Long-term repeated exposure to subconcussive head impacts has been suggested as a key factor for the development of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And then they're saying basically S100B is a member of that family, which I talked about, and that describes everything I just mentioned. So, you know, lots of times I get the question, should I let my child do uh, combat, you know, fighting, or should I let my child do boxing, should I let my child play football, should I let my child play soccer? And so you have to make that decision yourself. I probably need to do some more videos on on that, but in essence, what we're seeing is that these astrocytic markers are going up with the with the head impacts, which have the greater magnitude, so to speak, of force. So, and this is in high school athletes. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy has been found in high school athletes. At this point, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a postmortem diagnosis, meaning we can only really diagnose it if someone passes away. But it has been confirmed not only in NF. Let me say it this way, professional football players, it's been confirmed in college football players, it's, been, it's been confirmed in high school football players. So more evidence of what's going on, but here we see that we do have 
uh, better lab markers at this point for predicting the effects of brain injury. And that's pretty cool. So I still stand by that. I think that imaging is, is accelerating and it's becoming the gold standard for validating if there is what you would call a concussion or if there is post-concussion syndrome. There are many other factors along with that, including eye movement testing, video nystagmography, neurocognitive testing, looking at a person's symptoms, all of those factors are very important, but imaging is accelerating and lab testing is developing too. So that's the summary. Let me know your questions and good morning to everybody who's joined. And, um, and yeah, and I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. So take care everyone and I will talk to you soon.